we're taught from birth a set of principles that leads us to conclude that law establishes order and that without law we would have no order. Among these principles are the idea that there are none good. It's every man for himself. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's survival of the fittest. Only the strong survive. Resources are limited. I'm taking what's mine. And we therefore conclude that without the rule of law and its enforcement, we would have chaos. I believe that we are inherently compassionate. We are all members of one body and one spirit, interdependent upon each other. I believe in survival of the cooperative, not survival of the fittest. I believe that resources are abundant and that my overflow spills on you and yours onto me. I believe that love, compassion, empathy, and understanding create peace, not law. The law principle says that you can coerce behavior from an undesired behavior into a desirable behavior through the promise of reward and the threat of punishment. This means that your starting point is people do not want to do what is right or what is best or what is civil or what is what we agree upon about how people should behave, but we can force them to through the promise of reward and the threat of punishment. I believe that through love, compassion, empathy, and understanding, the intent of the heart changes to be in harmony with those kinds of behaviors that are desirable. And then the behavior is intrinsic and naturally occurring. It is not an upstream battle to coerce people to comply with standards of kindness towards one another. Because under the law principle, the kindness is a false kindness. It's etiquette. It's behaving in a certain way because that's what's socially acceptable. And it's acting out of fear of the consequences and the ramifications of acting in a way that is not socially acceptable. Rather than being out of actual care for one another, in which the behavior simply happens organically and naturally. And so, because of this, we have this idea that without the rule of law, there would be chaos. What do you have without law is chaos. But that's a false conclusion. And it comes from this whole entire set of philosophies that says the strong survive. You're on your own. You had better be the one who is stronger. It comes from a notion that says we are not all members of the same one body. It comes from the idea that says for me to have what I want I can only get that by depriving you of what you want. And I believe in a notion that says, the best way for me to get what I want is by helping you to achieve what you want. That is survival of the cooperative. While I was preparing for this, I came across a note where I had written down what a popular evangelist claims is, quote, the gospel in a nutshell, end quote. And this tragic and satanic perversion of the gospel that this guy calls the gospel in a nutshell embodies so much of what I've just said are these toxic philosophies that lead us to believe that there's no order unless there is law, that there is no proper behavior without coercion. Listen for how many of these things that I have said are part of this toxic philosophy 
Again, there are none good. It's every man for himself. Dog eat dog. Survival of the fittest. Only the strong survive. Resources are limited. I'm taking with mine without the rule of law and its enforcement. We would have chaos. And here's what this guy says is the gospel in a nutshell. We are not good. Nobody does good. Nobody's perfect. We all fall short of God's standard of perfection. We all justly deserve his temporal and eternal punishment. We live under the wrath of God because he's holy, righteous, and just. And when we somebody, see somebody who's a violent mass murderer and we think they should get what they've got coming to them, that's exactly how God feels, but a whole lot more. Because he doesn't like lying or stealing or cheating or dishonoring parents taking his name in vain. God is going to settle the score. And he's going to give everybody what they have earned for themselves. We've broken his laws. All we have earned is punishment. But God is rich in mercy. And he desires to save sinners. But he can't just forgive it and pretend those things didn't exist. Because then he would be unjust. And he's not unjust. So his plan from eternity past was to send his son in human flesh to be a representative for you, to take the punishment you deserve, to take all of the righteous deeds he did his entire life, credit them to your account if you will repent and put your trust in his son. He will forgive you because he makes you perfect in Christ. The very foundation that I addressed in the satanic Romans Road evangelism model. We are not good. That is the satanic principle behind all of these toxic philosophies. Intrinsically, inherently, you cannot trust anybody. You're on your own. Good luck. Nobody does good. It's dog eat dog. Anybody will take the opportunity to stab you in the back and take what's yours for themselves. It also comes from a philosophy that says resources are limited. Therefore, I can only have what I have if you don't have it. You must not have it in order for me to have it. That's the kind of mentality behind the idea that even requires a law. Because if I get what I want by giving you what you need, and when you get what you need, I get what I need, We don't need rules that tell me how to behave towards you in order to provide something that's of mutual benefit. So I want to illustrate that when it comes to sports and games and other competitive natured things, rules are required in order to properly conduct the game or competition. Because otherwise, first of all, you don't even know what the competition is if you haven't established rules that say, here's what the competition is. So if we take, for example, soccer, there's a rule that says you can't just pick up the ball and run with it. Then it would be rugby. So we come up with this idea that's called cheating. And cheating is really just when you're not playing by the rules of the game, which really means you're not actually playing that game anymore. So if you were to pick up the soccer ball off the field and start running with it, you wouldn't be playing soccer anymore. You'd be playing rugby. But we shame people and guilt people into this compliance by saying you're cheating. Well, they're not cheating. They're just not playing the same game. And so that's chaos. Chaos is when you have a rule and someone is playing by a different set of rules. So chaos is when 11 players are playing soccer and the other 11 are playing rugby. 
chaos is when the people in the pool are playing water polo and one guy grabs the ball and walks on the deck and takes a slam dunk into the goal. Well, he's not playing water polo anymore. And so you need to have rules that say you're not actually playing this game that we're playing. In order to comply with properly playing this game, we have to have rules. So if you think that there's chaos, if you don't have rules, you don't understand that two differing sets of rules being complied with is what chaos is. Chaos is when one person plays basketball while everyone else is playing water polo. And when one person plays soccer while everyone else is playing rugby. Or the other way around. And one of the things in competition is that the nature of competition is that there's winners and there's losers. And the goal of the competition is always to be the winner, and you can never achieve the goal of being a winner without taking that away from those you are competing against. So if the 49ers are playing the Seahawks, the 49ers cannot win the game, and the Seahawks also win the game. And in fact, a tie is not ideal either, because if a tie was ideal, there'd be no point in having the competition, because you begin with a tie. And if a tie was in any way ideal, the most ideal thing to do would be nothing and just preserve the status quo of the initial situation. So there can only be a winner by virtue of taking that away from the others. Competition, though, is limited in how well it illustrates what I want to illustrate because... A competition is striving together in unity. That's what compete means. And so the reason for having a game or a competition is that there's some kind of benefit intrinsic to having the competition. And if there wasn't, you wouldn't have the competition. The whole reason for competing is that even if you lose, there's a benefit in competing. Otherwise, there's no point in doing it at all. It's just that there's one portion of it that says only one of you gets to have this, this outcome. And you get it by taking it from the other. And that's what's good about the illustration of competition. Is that the outcome is it's either you or me that wins. It's either one or the other that wins. It is interesting, though, that when it comes to games, if it was merely about the outcome, then anything goes. And not only that, but when you don't have a value in the competition itself, then it's only worth doing if you win. And if it's only worth doing with you win, it makes me think of a saying that says, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. I think it's Marshall Rosenberg who says that. And that doesn't mean that if it's worth doing, do it poorly. It means that if it's worth playing guitar, it's worth playing guitar when all you can do is, out of rhythm and out of sync, play root notes. It's worth doing even when it's being done yet poorly. If it's only worth doing when it's done well, then it's not really that worth doing. If there is no value intrinsic in the competition, then it's only a value when you win. And that creates problems. It creates problems when the only thing that matters is that it's done well, and the only thing that matters is that you win. And that there isn't a benefit in the engagement itself. And that's the model of life that many seem to have. It's only worth doing if it's done well. It's only worth competing if you win. Winning is everything. Winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. 
these are models that are put upon us that say, don't be a loser. That there's something somehow wrong with the initial stages of learning something that it's not worth doing if you still do if you can only do it poorly it's not worth doing contrary to the idea that if it's worth doing it's worth doing poorly it's worth learning to do it it's worth making those mistakes that teach you the better way but what I want to explain here is that I'm just as in favor of people behaving in an orderly fashion with kindness towards one another. I'm just as in favor of people feeling a sense of security and safety. I'm just as in favor of people respecting the property of others. But I wholeheartedly disagree with the strategy of using law and law enforcement to establish that. And that can seem completely senseless when you're taught none are good. You're on your own. Take what you can. Take it while the getting's good. Don't let anybody take what's yours. This kind of hostile, violent, combative, negative view, suspicious of one another is what causes us to think without law there can only be chaos. But that's because it's not putting into play what creates that environment in the first place. What creates an environment that says I need to take what's mine at your expense? What creates an environment that says, I can't trust you? What creates an environment that says, I got to get while the getting's good? And I suggest that there's a mentality that underlies it. And one of the roots of it is, there is none good. One of the roots of it is, you're on your own. One of the roots of it is that we are not all members of the same one body. One of the roots of it is that there's a grand cosmic divine battle between two sides that are at eternal unrest with one another. That there is no peace, there is no rest. And this model is the model so prevalent and so common and so tragic. This model leads to situations where people say, I want to feel safe. We need more laws and more enforcement. But what we really need is more understanding of another viewpoint and more compassion for the different circumstances and different responses and different strategies another person has. And I like to engage in the exercise of trying to realize, working from a principle, let's say, that every single person has developed a strategy that is sound and logical for whatever their circumstances combined with their experiences combined with their education and mental conditioning all these factors put together what a person does is the most reasonable course of action possible to achieve their goals solve their problems and meet their needs So when you take that approach, 
you no longer have somebody who's a disgusting thief or filthy liar. You have people that have developed a strategy for meeting their needs that is hurtful towards others. And when the only thing that they've gone wrong with is their strategy for meeting their needs, then that's where we get into the whole idea of do you meet your needs by taking from me? Or do you meet your needs by giving to me? Do I meet your needs by providing... Do I meet my needs by providing for yours? Or do I meet my needs by subtracting from yours? And most of these strategies that cause lead to the kinds of behaviors we don't want are rooted in the idea of developing a strategy where I take what I get at your expense. It's almost always, as far as I've been able to determine in my own unscientific meditating on such things, this philosophy that I get what I want by taking it from you is what leads to the strategies that hurt one another. Then we respond to these strategies that hurt one another by saying, you need to pay for what you've done. We need to return the harm that you have caused back to you. I recently saw some people very outraged that someone had committed a murder and their sentence was a 10-year sentence. And so the notion was that the person who was murdered was deprived of more than 10 years of life that they would have had. So it's an absolute injustice for the person who committed the murder to only be forfeiting 10 years of their life when they took so much more. That the imbalance of the harm done is the definition of what we call justice or injustice. If you receive back to you harm in equal measure to the harm that you've caused, we call that justice. There's no concept of healing or restoration or understanding or of saying what caused a person to think this was a good way to solve their problems and what could we have done that would have had a better strategy. What would have produced a better strategy? One that didn't have to deprive somebody of their life or of their property or of their sense of security or of their value or whatever it is that we are taking from each other thinking that's the only way I can get mine. So from this root we are in constant conflict with one another. You cannot have what you want unless it's at my expense, and I cannot have what I want unless it's at your expense. And when you develop a strategy to take what's mine so that you can have it, my sense of justice says you need to have equal harm returned to you. So the law mentality says that your design, your desire, your strategy is to take from me. It's to harm me because that's how you get what you want. And so in order to have a civil and safe and orderly society where we treat each other properly, 
you need to be rewarded for acting in accordance with treating me kindly. And you need to be punished for acting in a way that is in disharmony with treating me kindly. Because by nature, the strategy you develop is to take from me. That's the logical outcome of the philosophy you've been taught. You need to take from me to get what you want. And now we need a law that tells you don't take from me to get from to get what you want. You need a law that threatens you with a punishment for taking what's not yours. Even though the philosophy you're taught is take what's not yours or else you'll never have it. Wouldn't it make sense, perhaps, that you wouldn't develop a strategy of taking what's not yours? If you weren't taught, that's the way you survive. If we weren't taught that only the strong survive, and we were taught that the cooperative thrive, and in fact, even when it comes to top predators in the animal world, what are the top predators almost always are a social animal. And they almost always, not in every case, I mean, certainly there are, for example, eagles hunt alone, but in many cases at least, they are animals that hunt cooperatively. So it's not merely a matter of whoever's most cold-hearted and vicious and has the biggest bombs and the sturdiest tanks, but those who work together to develop better ways. And when we do that, then we come up with creative solutions. But since the law principle says to use the promise of reward and the threat of punishment to coerce behavior, which hasn't been addressed at its root cause, which hasn't been addressed at what leads to people developing the strategies that they use that are the ones we don't want them using, like shooting people or stealing from people or stabbing people or raping people or whatever it is that we're doing that we think is a logical and sound conclusion based on what we've been taught and conditioned and experienced that we need to take to get. It never addresses a better strategy. The law principle, in fact, undermines any capacity you have for developing a creative solution to your problem. Because you have the law. And the law says, here's what you do. And in fact, this is in the Bible. And the Bible says... What are you doing? Why are you taking each other to court? Don't you have the wisdom to solve the problems yourselves? And the answer is no, because they have the law. They have the law. Let that decide the outcome. We would develop better strategies for dealing with things if we didn't brand people as being you are what you do and your value is how well you do it. And if instead we said you had a strategy that made sense to you, let's look into why that made sense to you and what other strategies could have been used. And the law principle even says let's try to make this strategy less appealing through the promise of punishment. 
let's try and make this strategy seem less appealing by creating a punitive deterrent to make take some of the luster off of this particular strategy. But I'm saying let's be creative enough to develop strategies that are actually better. And there's limits anyway to trying to develop punitive deterrence. One of the most notable I can think of is the person who goes on some kind of shooting spree. And then turns it on themselves. Sure, you could make the gun less available. That can make it less convenient to come to that particular strategy. But as far as punitive deterrence, there's nothing you can do. That person's already going to take their own life. And in fact, I suggest that probably there's a factor in there where the person is doing what they're doing in order to be able to provoke themselves to the point of taking their own life that part of the point might be now I'm a disgusting murderer. Now I can finally kill myself. And so you might make one particular way of executing that strategy less convenient. But you still haven't taken away the fact that that person can think of something to do that they find abhorrent enough that now I finally can kill myself. Now that I've done this disgusting thing, I finally am where I can take my own life. Maybe we need to develop a strategy of why a person wants to push themselves into that corner. And most likely it involved being taught such things as you're on your own. Good luck. It's every man for himself. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and only the strong survive. It probably involved being taught, Suck it up, snowflake. Toughen up. Well, they toughened up enough to murder people. How do you like that? Maybe there could have been a point at which somebody said, let's talk about these things you're going through and see if we can find a way to relate to it and to develop better strategies and teach the value that we each have. That we hold these truths to be self evident meaning nobody even needs to provide evidence for us and it's truth that all are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights it means nothing can take it away nothing can take it away and if you're born with these rights then it doesn't depend on being the citizen of a particular nation and it doesn't depend on what kind of behavior you exhibit. Because if it did, it wouldn't be an inalienable right. It wouldn't be something you're endowed with by your creator. And it wouldn't be self-evident. Among which are the life, our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Liberty not law enforcement and this is something that cannot be taken that's a philosophy I very much consider inspired 
if anything in all of history were ever written directly out of the mouth of God, that would be it. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I find absolutely nothing I've ever read or come across to be more directly, divinely inspired than that. And I'll plant my flag on that hill and die on it if I have to. I don't care who wants to disagree with me on that. That is the word of God. So if we really believe that, then we don't want to live in a nation of laws. We want to live in a land of liberty. And in order to exercise liberty, you have to exercise compassion and wisdom and understanding and the ability to see something from someone else's perspective and go, I see how you got there. Now let's get you out of there. So I'm just as much in favor of the kind of society that we all want to have of peaceful coexistence and, harm and harmony and kindness towards one another and love for one another I vehemently disagree that law will ever get us there I often say that politics is a large group of people who believe that laws will be the solution to their problem. And then they divide into factions over which laws, how they will be enforced, how much money will be put into it, how high will taxes be to fund that. And that's politics. The root of politics is to say, we will solve our problem with laws. I don't think we solve our problems with laws. I think we solve our problems with compassion. I think we solve our problems with empathy. I think we solve our problems with creative problem solving that isn't being undermined by taking each other to court and demanding retribution and considering justice to be the returning of harm for harm. I consider the solution to our problems to be something that we each need to individually look upon and think with every single person I come across Am I treating this person as myself? Because Jesus said, Love your neighbor as yourself. Not love your neighbor if he's enough like yourself. But love him as though he is you. That can be a bit of a pickle if you don't love yourself. And if you've got a philosophy that says you can only have what you want if you take it from me and I can only have what I want if I take it from you. And let's take a look at what kind of attitude Jesus expressed in the book of Matthew towards those who behaved on the basis of the promise of reward. Because this is one of my pet peeves even, that this is presented as Here's Jesus teaching 
eternal conscious torment. For a religion that's based on how God treats you after you're dead. When it's quite clear in this passage, this what's being expressed here is what kind of motives drives a person. What kinds of reasons a person has for doing what they do. And the difference between the sheep and the goats was that one felt compelled to act out of love for one another. And the other felt compelled to act only on the basis of the promise of reward and therefore did not act. So in Matthew 25, starting at verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. None of this has anything to do with believing in a certain creed or doctrine, according to what your denomination says is how you get God to change his mind about the depraved things he plans to do to you when you're dead. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungered and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in, or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come unto you? Because, hey, they would have done it if they had seen it was him and there was a promise of reward. Hey, it's the king. We, we can be rewarded if we treat him right. And the king shall say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brothers, you have done it unto me. Well, that right there says that the least are equal to the king. And that the least are of the same body as the king. Then sh shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in, naked, and clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hunger and a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick and in prison, and did not minister unto you? Then shall he answer them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the right, righteous into life eternal. And I just realized I characterized the first group as being the ones that didn't act according to the promise of reward. It's the, Obviously, it's the second group that didn't act because they didn't see that there was a reward in it. The first group acted regardless of any intent that there's a reward. And when you understand that the reward, as the book of James says, the man who hears the word and, and does it is blessed in his deed. When you understand that the reward is in the very act itself, then you're leaning into the principle that I get what I want by giving you what you need, and you get what you need by giving me what I need. And therefore, to help one another is to be blessed in the deed. Because now you understand that I don't get what I want by taking it from you. I get what I want by giving what you need. I let my overflow spill onto you so that your overflow can spill onto me. We're on to the next guy. 
the, the pay it forward ideal. But it doesn't matter because that's that's just the same thing as a circulatory system. That's the blood moving from the heart and then to the lungs and then to the extremities or into the lungs and then up to the brain. It's a circulatory system. So if you understand that it's a circulatory system of one body, then for me to provide for you is for you to provide to the next and so on and the circulation continues and he who does the work is blessed in his deed because we all reach what it is that we really want and that we really need by providing for each other by helping those in need by taking what it is that I have and letting it spill over to you. Then that is what is helping me get what I need and helping you get what you need. And we don't need to take from each other and we don't need to threaten each other and we don't need to be suspicious of each other and we don't need to be in conflict and combat with each other. Because if we think about it, there's a strategy one that the law principle is undermining and hiding from us and blinding us from seeing because instead we're saying here's what the law says I get to have and here's what the law says you get in return for what you've done instead of saying let us reason together and figure out how we can both get what we want and that's why because of this particular paradigm that the law gives us. We think that the concept of compromise is so abhorrent. Because to us, compromise is, I don't really get what I want so that you can also not really get what you want. And neither of us is truly satisfied with the outcome, but at least nobody got zero. So it's a tie. Wasn't there something there about it's not worth doing if the if the desired outcome is a tie? There's no point in doing anything. And that's our concept of compromise is I'm going to get what I want by taking it from you and you're going to get what you want by taking it from me. So let's settle somewhere in the middle where neither of us is satisfied. But really, the goal is to be creative enough to say, we know just from, from the commercial market itself, the, the whole concept of commerce is that I get what I want by giving you what you want. That's what commerce is. So we know that it's, it's a thing. It's real. It happens. I can get what I want by giving you what you want. And what we really need to do is establish better strategies that involve providing for the needs of all from the abundance of resources and letting that with which I am blessed spill over onto you and that which with which you are blessed spill over onto others.